Welcome to the Gene Food Podcast. I'm your host, John O'Connor. Hey, everybody. Before I get into the episode, I always forget to plug our custom nutrition plan product. We have an algorithm that scores people into one of 20 diet types based on genetics. If you're listening and you haven't tried the product yet, you can use coupon code PODCASTGF for, I believe, 15% off. And we have recently added a product called Keto Score to the nutrition plan. So you'll see on one tab your gene food assigned diet type, two week meal plan, um, ability to download that via PDF. And then there's another tab, which is going to show you your keto score. And basically keto score is getting into genes like PPARA alpha, which have a, uh, almost operate as like a metabolic dividing line where some people who carry common variants in these genes can't achieve nutritional ketosis. And if they go on a diet that's really high in fat and saturated fat and butter, then they're going to see their lipid markers look pretty unhealthy. And so little known fact, there is a genetic dividing line out there that allows some of us to achieve a state of ketosis and others of us not. So um, with keto, you always want to, it can be great for some people, but you always want to test and make sure that it's great for you. Which kind of leads me to the topic of my conversation today, just doing a closeout episode to end the year. Uh, a year that I think a lot of us are probably pretty happy to see behind us. Um, 2020 for me was really stressful and really difficult like it was for a lot of you. Um, Ended up moving and uh, going all over the country and uh, having a lot of difficulty and things to deal with. But I was also blessed to be in a position where the things that I had to deal with pale in comparison to some of what you were dealing with and, um, and some of what people in um, my community were dealing with. And so I kind of recognized that um, although it's been a difficult year, there's a lot to be thankful for as well. And kind of where my head's at right now with the nutrition world is finding, I don't want to use the word, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but finding scary parallels to our world of politics. And I think no matter where you sit on the political fence, um, to the extent that you're paying attention at all. And probably you'd be better off if you weren't. Um, unfortunately, I went down a bit of a rabbit hole during the election and uh, kind of dusted off my old political science major uh, roots and, and, and got pretty pretty interested in what was going on and came to the conclusion um, from 10,000 feet that we have a lot of really crazy people in our government and commenting on what goes on in our government (laughs) and that the more extreme and the more uh, general, the, 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 the more general, the conclusions you can draw, the more extreme positions you can take, the more clickbaity, um, your writing and your headline is the more eyeballs are going to be drawn to your message. And regardless of which side of the political fence you sit on, um, hopefully you can recognize that there are members of your coalition um, that are affiliated with your uh, your side of the fence that are absolutely out of their mind. And, um, and that is true all, not only of politics, but it's also bleeding into our nutrition conversations and it has for some time. I am, I don't want to say amazed because I guess I'm no longer amazed, but, but I'm, I'm on the borderline of being amazed every single time I turn on nutrition Twitter or listen to certain podcasts and just the level of certitude which with with which these blanket recommendations are being made it it really does it do, really does kind of boggle my mind um you know i sent out a newsletter our last newsletter um take the carnivore diet quiz was was the title and there's people that I know in the nutrition space who uh, subscribe to the newsletter and some of them are, you know, like moderate level influencer types. And we actually had um, somebody who's, you know, who we're, who we're friendly with as an organization opt out of our newsletter. And um, not only that, but file an abuse complaint as spam with MailChimp because we, um, because I said in the newsletter that the, unblinking support in the nutrition community for, for example, the carnivore diet makes me more cynical about this space. And that's true. That's how I feel. Um, now that does not mean that I don't look on, um, protocols like what Jordan Peterson is going on and what Michaela Peterson is going on and what Amber O'Hearn is going on and what, uh, Paul Saladino is going on. 
I look at those with total respect and empathy. And look, I mean, um, I know people who have struggled with different chronic conditions, different unexplained illnesses, and sometimes they need to go on unique protocols in order to solve for those issues. Um, I in- interviewed Amber O'Hearn on the podcast last year, and I really like Amber. You know, we trade emails sometimes. She's really cool. She's basically like the 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 catalyst for the entire carnivore diet movement. And she has been very clear and very brave in sharing her story and saying, look, I need to be on this protocol for my mental health. This is how I function at my best. And same with Jordan Peterson, same with Michaela Peterson, same with Paul Saladino. These are, you know, Paul Saladino has been on a bunch of podcasts and he's talked about how he needed this diet to, to beat back eczema. Tip my hat, not for me to say, um, not for me to judge. Where I, what I was trying to do with our last newsletter, um, and I'm basically giving you the substance of the newsletter in this last, this last episode of the podcast, is to say that where I do part company with these ex- many of these extreme diets and you know where I find myself equally turned off by extreme politics is when the blanket statements start coming out and when the marketing starts outpacing the science and when people start saying, well, every human needs to be on this diet or it's strongly implied. Because the other end of the success stories of the people that are on these protocols are the people who contact us at Gene Food who have off the charts high LDL particle count, whose blood lipid markers look terrible, whose inflammatory markers look terrible, who look like they've eaten themselves into a state of, you know, death by going on these protocols that are marketed to them with zero grains of salt, zero caveats, zero differentiation points between why person A would be on, want to be on a protocol like that and why person B would want to be on a protocol like that. We've done, Aaron and I have done past episodes where we have been really hard on a lot of the people in the vegan space. I mean, we did two episodes on the Game Changers movie and we, you know, we don't like to use the word debunked around here because it's so pugilistic and un- unnecessarily confrontational. This is, these conversations are supposed to, to help people turn on their own individual light bulbs so that they can see the path forward so that they can feel better. But we basically debunked a lot, a lot of the stuff that was in the Game Changers movie. And, you know, we covered the James Wilkes versus Chris Kresser debate. We are not vegan partisans. Um, we're trying really hard not to be diet partisans at all. The flip side to that coin is with something like carnivore, there are these um, metabolic processes in the body that are never discussed when these diets come up. And one of the ones that I drew attention to in my newsletter was the urea cycle. So we have a five-step enzymatic process in the body where we take the organic nitrogen that is in animal flesh and we have to do something with it. It's, we break it down and we get rid of it. And the way that the body does that is it uses a series of enzymes that break the organic nitrogen into ammonia, the ammonia in the liver, the kidney then turns that organic nitrogen waste into uh, urea, and then essentially you pee it out. So there is metabolic waste associated with eating meat. It's not just the inflammatory amino acids that Walter Longo talks about. It's not just the lipid impact of the fats that are in the meat. It's, a, it's the actual nitrogen content of the meat that your body has to do something to break down. Google urea cycle. Google urea cycle Harvard. There's a really good Harvard Health blog that talks about why some people may feel better than others on a high-protein diet. And they talk about the urea cycle. And they talk about loss of function. Kids who are born with no urea cycle function, who as soon as they eat any kind of protein, they have really terrible and toxic levels of ammonia in the blood. Ammonia in the blood is a problem because ammonia is a mitochondrial toxin. Ammonia is a neurotoxin. Um, There's all sorts of studies linking elevated ammonia to dementia and, and cognitive decline. It's not to say that if you eat meat, that you're going to have any of these issues. That's not what I'm saying. I eat meat for what it's worth, you know, just because I eat meat has no bearing on whether you should, but I do. Somebody else could. But when you start taking and extrapolating from, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to eat meat, you know, with a meal here or there, and, and no, I'm going to eat two pounds of meat every day. And if somebody talks about why that's potentially a bad idea, even in a diplomatic way, then that's something where we've created an enemy. That is the problem with these social media algorithms. That is the problem with what, with what we are doing to each other out there. We live in an incredibly balkanized tribal, you know, 
a culture where we have these camps of people that have made these decisions about things and they just have these echo chambers. And anybody that tries to interject some degree of nuance is either not listened to or cast out. And, and so you're looking at these protocols and you're saying, all right, well, you have the urea cycle and we know because we do nutrigenomics at gene food that there's a variance in these genes that can change the enzyme activity. It's the same thing with MTHFR. So MTHFR in our view has been way overblown. You know, it's, it's something where, you know, people are saying, oh, I have this problem because of my, because I quote, have MTHFR. Um, you know, MTHFR variants are extremely common in Caucasian European populations. And when you look at, um, when you try to uh, attribute uh, a, a specific disease state to a, to a SNP that is, you know, carried by 30 or 40% of the general population, less common in African American populations and a lot of the, a lot of the commentary like on sites like 23andMe and, 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 um, and some of the other blogs that have been written about MTHFR kind of ignore some of the data on the black community. But, um, but, but the, the point remains is that even though you can't necessarily attribute MTHFR to some disease state, I mean, you might be able to say, I have high homocysteine. What you're talking about is you're talking about a reduced function, a reduced ability to convert folate into methylfolate, which is the active, the bioactive form that the body can use. So it's this enzymatic process, and some people are given l less um, power behind that process than others. And the same is true for the for the urea cycle. There are pretty common variants in the re urea cycle that are going to give person A full urea cycle function or close to urea cycle function, and then person B or C much less than full urea cycle function. A person like that goes on a diet that's really high in, in meat. They're eating, you know, pound of meat a day or whatever the carnivore diet protocol is. And then they get their blood tested and they have elevated ammonia. Well, is the carnivore diet healthy for that person? And the problem that I have with these conversations is people that are advocating for all of these different diets, they never give the caveat. They never, they never give up the fort. They never admit any type of defeat or any type of nuance. They just come right back at you because the goal is to win. And, um, you know, I want to win in business and there's a lot of things I want to win in. I mean, I, I, I'm a big Ohio State football fan. I want Ohio State to win against Northwestern this weekend in the Big Ten Championship game. And, and I'm not in some ways carving myself out from uh, competitive streaks or even from getting my ego involved and, and you know, uh, being a jerk or arguing a point. But, but oh my God, I mean, when it comes down to these issues that are going to affect people's health and we can't have conversations about the urea cycle, we can't have conversations about different levels of hydrochloric acid in the blood, right? It's like, well, the, the blood type diet has been debunked. Yeah, it has. It has been debunked. But there's also, there's also, it's also true that your blood type dictates your hydrochloric acid levels in your, in your stomach to a certain degree. So we have pretty good research that shows that people with type A plus blood have the lowest levels of hydrochloric acid and somebody with type O blood has the most. So we act like we're at the tip of the spear scientifically that we figured out that it's lectin or some, you know, plant defense compound that's causing, you know, everybody's autoimmune issues. Um, but really what we're doing is we're having these incredibly narrow, incredibly partisan conversations about these issues that are, that are flying blind to a lot of the new science of personalized nutrition, which is going to take over. I mean, nutrigenomics is going to be a part of it. Microbiome is going to be a part of it. But in the future, it's going to be like, oh, well, I can't be on a carnivore diet because I found out that I have two SNPs in the urea cycle, um, in my urea cycle genetics that reduce uh, enzyme activity by, you know, 60%. And I find that when I go on a high meat diet, I have um, high levels of, of ammonia in the blood. And I also find um, through my weekly microbiome test that my um, putrescine producing uh, bacteria in my colon are, you know, proliferating at an incredible rate when I do this. And also my TMAO levels are high. Those are the types of conversations that I, that we're advocating for ways to not to be respectful of protocols like the carnivore diet, to understand that some people need to be on these protocols to listen to those people when they tell us that they need to be on these protocols. But at the same time, to draw attention to the fact that this is not something that is suitable for most people. Here's why. Here's the test you can take to determine whether it's working for you, whether it's not working for you. If your ammonia gets really high, that's a problem. And what I'm going to link to in the show notes is a 
uh, a link to a quiz you can take. It's put out by a, a biotech company and it's basically a urea cycle. It's, a, it's basically like a urea cycle test. And what's, what it's trying to, what it's trying to determine or help people determine is whether ammonia is an issue that's causing health problems for them. Because nobody's testing for ammonia. When was the last time your doctor did an ammonia, ammonia blood test for you, right? And none of the people that are advocating for certain diet protocols that could put your ammonia levels higher are even telling you that you'd, e- that you'd even need to check. And more likely, they would tell you a reason why ammonia blood tests were debunked and there's no reason to test. And actually, it's okay because, you know, uh, I mean, God knows why, right? So as we close out the year... Um, I wanted to just throw this podcast up, get a podcast up. It's been on our team, a lot of work that we've been putting into our software this year and some of the podcast episodes have been pushed behind. Um, if you're a regular listener, I really appreciate you listening and I'm glad you find value in, uh, in what we're doing. If you get a chance, we'd always appreciate um, a review on any of the podcast platforms, especially Apple iTunes. And we're going to have some good guests and some good content in the new year. So um, I hope that everybody has a happy holidays and a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And we will look uh, for you all in the new year. Thank you so much for listening. See you soon. The Gene Food Podcast is our attempt to synthesize the latest developments in the fields of genetics, nutrition, and medicine, and offer you practical tips and stories you can use in your own unique health journey. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more information online at mygenefood.com.